Welcome to Purple Easel Spotlight, where we put the spotlight on artists and creatives. My name's LaToya. And I'm Megan. And we're here at California's largest paint sip studio. Both of us are art instructors here at Purple Easel. And today we're going to be talking about Pablo Picasso. So I actually have a lot to say about Pablo Picasso. Um, he's very well known for his avant-garde art. Um, however, I don't think a lot of people know that he does other things. He had a whole slew of different art styles that he um, did. And he's very well known for the cubism art, but he did all sorts of surrealism and realism and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. He was actually classically trained. Too. Yes. His, uh -huh. his dad was an art instructor and a very, like, rigid art instructor. Mm -hmm. um, I know for a fact, at one point, he had a falling out with his dad because his dad is like, you crazy, I don't like your stuff. Um, rain it back in and get your hair cut. And <laughs> He actually used to go by Ruiz Picasso, and he dropped the Ruiz, which was his father's name, and went strictly with his mother's maiden name. Ooh, daddy issues. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about a little bit of some of the periods that he went through, because he went through a lot. It seems like he went through a lot looking into the different periods. And so the first one that we want to highlight is the blue period. He had... Um, gone to a little bit of a depression because one of his close friends had passed. So he started painting all of, a lot of his paintings in uh, blue tones and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. little saddy waddy kind of paintings. Yeah, and it really reflected the subject matter too. He was kind of taken by the fringes of society and the poor and people who might have been considered uh, low men on the totem pole, basically. Mm -hmm. And it kind of created that extra somberness by using that color palette. But then things got better. <laughs> Entering the rose period, which is the complete opposite. More yes, what he fell in love. Oh, is that why he was using red? Yeah. And he started like <laughs> hanging around the circus mm -hmm. and all that gaiety and like creativity and stuff really like kicked him up a notch and took him right out of the blues. Yes. So on the Picasso website, there was also this very, very short and brief um, African period um, where he got inspired by like African masks and tribal things, but it seemed like there wasn't a whole lot of information on that. It just seemed like pretty short. And then it, it kind of run in, into cubism. Yeah. And so um, it's argued amongst the art world if he created or co-created it. It seemed like there's a lot of... Yes. <laughs> From what I've seen, and you can see a lot of the influences of the tribal art, Native American mm -hmm. art, everything kind of popping up right around that time. And then also as he progresses into cubism, um, there is like one other dude, and I can't remember his name offhand. Maybe we can look it up and flash it on the screen for you guys. Um, that they're basically the fathers of cubism. Mm. But there is one piece in particular, and it's the Ladies of Avignon which was like considered the first because leading up to this picasso had started to strip out like background scenery and context and just having whatever figure he was concentrating on and this is the first time he really flattened everything okay. and put it all together so you're seeing multiple perspectives and getting that kind of crazy Picasso vibes that you get where like an eye is sideways and you have the straight on, you have the profile kind of all happening at once. And it was so far out of the box. <laughs> yeah. It basically obliterated the box. <laughs> and even his friends who were like fans of his were like, uh. Mm -hmm. And this is why he's also so well known, which is going to be one of my questions to you, which is, I guess I'll ask it right now. Okay. Um, so uh, from even though we're not done um, going through all of the periods, um, why is it that you think that Picasso is mostly known for cubism? I think because it was such a disregard for everything that existed in the art world prior to that. Yes. And it... You can say whatever you want about modern art and like some things you may not consider art, um, but it turned things on their head mm -hmm. so like violently. Yes, there it did. The very structured, think of like Renaissance paintings and the triangular composition mm -hmm. and even the use of color coming out of post-impressionism 
Um, yeah, it was just so different. So different. Like he was just seeing things to a point where people are like, I don't get it. And yeah. you could never have said that about most art yeah. prior to that. Yeah. Really pushed the envelope on that one. Yeah. So he did cubism for a very long time. Um, and then he moved on to classism. And uh, that was another. Yeah, it was another period that he got into. Mm -hmm. And that's where there's this very famous um, portrait of Igor Stravinsky. Tra Stravinsky. Um, and it's a, he was friends with a Russian composer. But I remember in high school always looking at this portrait of Igor. And I don't know, our art teacher always just had us look at it. And we were like, okay, because I guess it's a very um, famous Picasso piece. It's not very Picasso-y. Well, kind of. But it's very much just a line art drawing of mm -hmm. his friend. Um, but that's one of his famous pieces that he did from um, Surrealism. And then pretty much after that, he just did a lot of mixed art from um, like before there was a civil war around the 1930s in Spain mm -hmm. um, that he was making kind of um, paintings based off of that. And then the post-war and things of that nature. Warnica. Yes. Warnica was born. One of his most famous works um, depicting a rather violent scene. Also, in a lot of his work, you see the fact that he was from Spain where bullfighting is very popular and it shows up a lot not only bulls but pigeons <laughs> did you know his dad like raised pigeons and they just flew around his house so then fast forward to when he had his own studio by the way he got his first studio when he was 16 he was like total child prodigy level mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he had pigeons hanging around his studio, too. Oh, wow. And he would draw them. Aww. And they would just hang out. Aww. And I imagine that was very odd for people who would visit. Because I think it was World War II. Might have been World War I. Um, he partnered with the Red Cross because all of the soldiers were like, we want to go to France and we want to see the Eiffel Tower and we want to see Picasso because at that point he was quite famous mm -hmm. um, and he could have capitalized on his fame by continuing the Rose period and stuff. But he's like, no, nah, I don't want to duplicate myself. Yeah. So he flipped it all again. Um, but that's a whole other thing. But yeah, he would allow soldiers to come and tour his studio. Mm -hmm. And I can just imagine him walking in and be like, like oh, oh, be Picasso. Yeah. Why are they changing this? <laughs> Didn't know this about you. <laughs> so did you know that Picasso actually had 23 names? What? No. Yeah. And we just know him as Picasso, which is crazy. But he was actually born Pablo Diego Jose Francisco de Puebla Juan Nepomucino Maria de los Remedios Cipriano de la Satissima Trinidad Martyr Patricio Clito Ruiz y Picasso. I probably butchered that, but oh my God. Can you imagine it? trying to sign that? <laughs> that was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea. Also, fun fact, he wrote like 16,000 paintings when he died. Yeah. That's insane. And a lot of them were his, but a lot of them were other artists that he'd known and collected from. Okay. You got to think about the period in which he lived. He was 91 years old and he created pretty much his entire life. Um, but basically starting right at the turn of the century mm -hmm. like when he really was coming up into art and you think of the transition the world was going through mm -hmm. industrialization and everything. And he lived through all these phases like impressionism, mm -hmm. post impressionism, and then created his own with cubism. It's it's crazy to think about how much happened in his lifetime mm -hmm. and how it reflected in his artwork, you know. When I was in high school and I learned about Pablo Picasso, I'm like, yeah, Pablo Schmablo. Um, I thought it was very, like, like traditional. You learn about Pablo. Mm -hmm. uh, but as an adult, I have a, um, like, newfound appreciation because maybe it's because I just lived a life. And, you know, in high school, you don't go through different periods, you know. Right. And it's just a kid. So, I don't know. I have definitely, not only is that cool, just looking at all the different art that he's created, um... But he was alive and sold millions of dollars. Like, he wasn't one of those artists that, like, okay, I'm dead, and then you sell. Right, right. <laughs> so he was actually the very first artist ever to be put in the loop while they were still alive. Ooh. I mean, he was 90. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> 
So to wrap up um, our Pablo Picasso talk, I wanted to um, talk about this quote that I feel is very reminiscent of this conversation and then who he is as a person. It is, style puts constraint on the artist, forcing a single viewpoint on things upon him. The same techniques, the same formula, year after year, his long life. So, Latoya, who are we going to talk about next? We're going to talk about Briani Lukita. First of all, her name is so pretty, and her art is so, so pretty. Um, we found her on Instagram. Um, yeah, uh, she's Indonesian. She loves plants. She loves cats. And her art is very Cubanism. Yes. And we only know those facts because we stalked her social media. We really wanted to highlight her because the art is amazing. But I think this is really the next iteration. Yeah, it's so, it's, um... It's just giving so much color. It's giving so pretty. It's like a beauty. It's like uh, Picasso. Sometimes his work can be very... Uh, what's the word to sound nice? Like monstrous. It's, it's very kind of like... Monstrous? Yeah, monstrous. It's kind of like that, you know? But hers is very like soft, feminine, like curvy, and like, I don't know, pretty colors. I just, I think it's so beautiful. Yeah, and even when you compare similar compositions, in comparison... Picasso tended to make things very flat. So mm -hmm. you might have a section, but it's going to be one color. She creates a gradient in it? each little section, and it just makes this like nice, peaceful. Yeah. Even though cubism generally is kind of jarring. Yeah. And it makes the viewer work. Mm -hmm. um, there's just something so like happy yeah her work <laughs> yeah I, I know it's hard to explain it's just it's such a mood it's just it really is it's <laughs> such a mood yes and you know what i think is interesting it's just my own little observation um where you see a lot of cubism is like coffee shops and coffee things and i actually have a little prop i'm gonna whip out right now oh, i got a little prop here oh what is this Oh, oh, hey, yeah, oh, it is. Yes, I have our very own break room here at Purple Easel. That is so funny. Yeah, you see this kind of art, um, almost mass produced at this mm -hmm. point, that is just slapped up anywhere. I think, in some ways, maybe because it's easier to produce, you're not trying mm -hmm. to create an exact likeness, and there's wiggle room in your composition and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's part of why it's become so prolific. Yeah. Actually, that's a very good observation on that. Um, I wouldn't have thought of it that way. But yeah, for sure. Yeah. Not to discount the amount of work that Cubist artists are putting into it. Mm -hmm. But the amount of time it would take to draw this face versus, yeah. you know, a portrait, detailed portrait of somebody. Mm -hmm. um, Good. Yeah. But even just watching some of the process videos for her, um, it's insane, like, just watching. It looks almost computer-generated. Like, it's <laughs> so clean. Yes, it's very clean. But she's actually doing it on canvas. And these are, like, really big canvases, mm. too. And she sells art to people all over the world. Wow. Like, she'll always say, like, oh, sending this out to France or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just... It's awesome. Yes. But we definitely wanted to highlight her. Um, her art is beautiful, amazing. Definitely go check her out. Um, we'll be linking all of that information and things that we talked about here today. All right. So I have a question for you this time. Me? Yes. So have you come across this where you're instructing a class and maybe you're walking around down on the floor and you hear somebody go, I'm a regular Picasso. Yes. Why does that happen all the time and how do they mean it? Are they being facetious because Picasso's famous and they mm -hmm. think their work is terrible? Or are they leaning into that whole cubist thing where, like, it can look however and you can call it art? Like, I don't know. I think it's because Picasso is very, not commercial, but every, you don't have to be an artist. or You, to know, you could be, like, um, an electrician or a nurse or something, but you know who Pablo Picasso is. He's accessible. Yes. Very much like Van Gogh. Mm -hmm. But I feel like Picasso is more just, just no. Anonymous with yeah. creating, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and then there was like that sound bite that was very popular. I was like, okay, I like it, Picasso. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like that helped. <laughs> yeah. But um, in general, I think it's just because he's so widely known. Probably, I would say like the most, because there's a lot, but that's the one I hear the most of like the seven years that I've been here. You know, and I some sources 
Time Life being one of them, really refer to them as the artist of the century. Mostly probably because he lived for basically a century. <laughs> um, that probably doesn't hurt. Yeah. yeah, I just think it's so interesting. Like, that's the constant callback. Like, why not Monet? Or like... Right. Rembrandt or, well, I, 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 so yeah, I think he's more accessible. Yeah, especially considering we're not necessarily doing Picasso style work yeah. generally, although we'll try to get on yeah. that. But um, yeah, it just so That's funny to me how it's just infiltrated pop culture and yeah, it's very vernacular at this point. Yeah, very. That's a really good question. It is very, very, very common. Like you hear all the yeah, time okay, here. Okay, so it's not just me. No. <laughs> All right, so that kind of helps me segue into our little discussion bit here. Um, and I was curious what your thoughts are on making art for yourself versus others or being commercial. Because obviously Picasso did not care. Oh, no. He was trying to make the monies, but he ended up making the monies. Yes. And lots and lots and lots of Yes. That's very, 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 very hard for me personally because I do both. I make commercial art for you to buy. You buy it. You buy it. <laughs> and that's so I do that specifically for that intention. But my personal art, I like guard it like a crab. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, I'm not selling it or I don't show it or I keep it to myself. And that's just for me and my eyes only. And I'm very like just guarding of it. Mm -hmm. So I actually kind of want to not do that. I want to <laughs> be able to just be like Picasso where I just make stuff for you and you like it and you, you buy it. Mm -hmm. But I think for me too, it's very it's like giving birth. I do not have children. But to me, it is, I created this, and it is mine, and it's so hard to let go sometimes. Yes, yes. and then I'll make stuff for people, that I'm like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I'm letting go of that one. Yeah. So, what do you think? Uh, I've definitely had things where somebody's like, oh, I like that thing that you made and posted. Can I buy it? And I'm just like, it's done for sale yet. Like, I gotta, I gotta work up to it. Mm -hmm. There are things that if I held on to it for a few years, I'll be like, all right, I gotta get rid of this. Like, if somebody wants it, yeah. I'll give it to them. That's true. I'll make them pay for it, of course. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of that, are you living to breathe? Or are you breathing to mm -hmm. live? Like, sometimes you need to survive. Yeah. You have to make stuff that might have wide appeal. Um, and that's something we do focus on yeah. for making paintings here, mm -hmm. too, is we want people to come and enjoy themselves. So it's got to be things that they want to come paint. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also the things that you just like that drive you, like Rihanna, cats and plants. And yeah. in all of her work. Yeah. You can tell she likes cats and plants because she posts pictures of all her cats and all her different house plants mm -hmm. and stuff. And for me, it's like, geeky stuff so yeah. i'm gonna draw ludo from labyrinth and i'm mm -hmm. going to draw um the statues from lord of the rings and you know all those things that i just enjoy mm -hmm. and if there happens to be somebody out there that it speaks to all the better yeah you know a lot of uh, so what you're saying i 100 percent agree with and also i feel like my commercial art is also very geeky and that's one way I'm like, you geeks like this stuff. You want Star Wars? Well, me repping Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. You want Star Wars then. You want the Transformers. You want the old school nostalgic stuff. Um, but then, yeah, I, I, I need to somehow combine. But then my, my other art, my personal art, is vastly different. <laughs> that is very... Hmm. Near deathy. <laughs> I just, if there is a... I was... What I, I have a whole thing about my personal art. My personal art, I want you to look at it and get a sense of peace. But that peace you get, like, it's so at the end. <laughs> it's at the end. very much like, uh, like, let go, like a release. Um, you're by yourself, you're alone, and it's quiet. Like, you know, like sitting on a beach by yourself. It's like, nice. There's no one around. Desert for me. I love desert. Um, being in the desert. Like that calming that's what I want. Like everything's okay. Yeah. Do it now. Yeah. yeah. We we can put a, a period on this. Yeah. That's how my personal art is. Yeah. Mine is just pretty things. It's I like to look at pretty. <laughs> like I have this fish phobia. Like I can't look at fish when I go past the sea. Oh, yeah. I can't talk about that. And I like fishing, but once it breaks the water, I got to hand my pole off to something. You're like, else. Oh, like <laughs> They creep me out. And most undersea life does as well. So I don't generally make it a point to draw or paint 
things in the ocean because <laughs> it's icky. <laughs> but <laughs> give me cute animals, give me beautiful landscapes, mm-hmm. flowers, like, and I'll do it in pretty much every medium. Okay. So yeah, I think yeah. I think it's interesting that mm-hmm. balance that we all have to strike as artists. Yes, that was a good discussion. From all of us at Purple Evil, thanks for tuning in. And make sure to check out the work by Paolo Picasso and Riani Lukita in the links below. Join us at purpleevilplus.com to paint with the world's largest paint and sip online community. And if you visit Southern California, be sure to check out our studio. In the meantime, create more and create often. Bye. Make sure to check out the works of Pablo Picasso and Rihanna. <laughs> Rihanna? <laughs> what a mirror. Red hair. The sun will come out tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah,